All right. Well, I, I'm going to do an introduction. As I said, I think just about everybody here knows Cookie, but these uh, these recordings go on YouTube, and I want to make sure that I do a nice introduction of Cookie so uh, she doesn't have to provide her entire history for us, um, even though we do we do know it. This is Six Degrees of Degradation, and I think Cookie is famous for really optimizing the sound. Over 30 years in the music industry, Cookie, uh, Cookie Marenko's creative and technical skills have touched almost every aspect of music and audio business. She's been awarded two gold records and worked on five Grammy nominated albums. She's widely known for the quality of her engineering work and for drawing our passionate performances from the artists she produces. She's been a pioneer in delivering DSD and high-res audio to consumers worldwide through the company Blue Coast Music. In the earliest days of computer audiophile experimentation, Marenko believed that a loyal, significant audience could be found for better sound delivered directly through the internet. Blue Coast Records quickly confirmed that belief. You really were a pioneer in this respect, Cookie. And we're very, we are, we, you've probably created uh, through your directly and indirectly through your efforts created more joy for audiophiles throughout this world than just about anybody else I would believe. So Thank after you. a 20 year, 20 year career as a recording engineer and producer, which prior to that she was a multi-instrumentalist, how many instruments do you play Cookie? Uh, well, <laughs> primarily piano, oboe and sitar. Okay, just a few. Um, the devolution of audio towards convenient but low resolution MP3 format concerned her. In response, Marenka returned to her roots in analog recording, developed a recording technique called Extended Sound Environment, ESC, with audiophile champion Jean-Claude Reynaud. They began producing exceptional acoustic performances in ESE that became the foundation of Blue Coast Records. So we, we are very excited to have you here, Cookie. I think you're going to talk a little bit about your history. And this, I think what I've been talking about is really the past. We we want to hear what, you, what you're current, currently doing, what's new, what's exciting, and just you know, a little bit about yourself. And of course, how we can make sure that we have the best sound and how you do produce the best sound for us. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, I've been, I've had the studio actually now for 40 years. And the way I got into it was, as you mentioned, I was uh, a, a jazz musician. I studied classical, piano, oboe, and then um, found that I had an interest in what's called temperament systems. And so I learned that around the world, not everybody has our Western temperament. I was tuning pianos when I was 19. Actually, I had 80 piano students by the time I was 18. Um, and I just wanted to expand my horizons in understanding what sound did. Uh, and, and so I, in bands, I played jazz, I played a lot of experimental avant-garde music, um, worked with synthesizers along with the, the piano, um, and really hadn't thought about being an audio engineer. That wasn't part of my plan. But somewhere along the way, the band wanted a demo tape. And they said, Cookie, you've got, <laughs> this is a perfect place for a recording studio. And we had just quit some crummy uh, punk band and thought, yeah, why not? So me and my uh, drummer boyfriend at the time, we both lived in this house and we said, okay, we each put in some money, went in and I said, here you go. Here's $20,000. What can I buy for it? And that was in 1981. I didn't know what I was doing. But I knew how to teach. I knew about sound. And that was really, you know, and I knew about music. Those were the things I think that helped me the most in extending my career as an audio engineer. So it just came down to every day going into the studio and learning something, um, practicing, recording, inviting friends over. And then on January 1st, 1982, we opened the doors and I haven't looked back since. So I think one of the keys to just staying in business was um, having had a successful piano teaching um, life that I knew how to make a phone call back, truthfully. So many people don't know what, you know, I hate to call it sales, but basically if you don't call people back, you're not going to get the gig. 
So I didn't know what I was doing the first few years, but I knew what sound uh, should sound like. I knew what musicians wanted, and I tried to really be empathetic to the musicians' needs. And then from there, I was asked to join the uh, A&R team at Wyndham Hill in the late 80s. And uh, do you guys all remember Wyndham Hill? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was, um, A&R are the people that get sent the demo tapes and make the decisions, so they say, on uh, what, what gets recorded. Now, a lot of that is just writing a lot of rejection notices, but you know, I met a lot of interesting people there. Um, I thought at the time I might wanna start a record label and this is back in the eighties, late eighties. And soon after realized, I don't ever wanna do this. I don't wanna start a record label. Well, that changed many years later. Um, and then during the nineties, uh, after I left Wyndham Hill, um, I, found a whole circle of people who seemed to want to hire me as a producer and engineer. And it was mostly in kind of the Americana bluegrass, bluegrass circles, uh, folk music, singer songwriters. So it wasn't too far off from what I was doing. Although, you know, new ages was a little more, probably not what I was doing. Most of my friends were jazz musicians. So even going into bluegrass was a bit of a stretch, but they liked me because I wasn't a bluegrass musician. I just looked at it as this is music. And then, um, you know, along the way, I had a lot of opportunities living in the Sil Silicon Valley. I was close to um, new developments. Uh, I worked with a company called Liquid Audio and was the first audio engineer to um, record a live concert upload it to the internet and have it downloaded worldwide, available for sale. And it actually predated Napster. Uh, that was like in 1997 at UCLA. We did this, <laughs> this dog and pony show as they used to call it. And at the time I wasn't thinking that, you know, MP3s were gonna rule the world. I saw it as a, what a great way to promote your music. Uh, it, just everything turned around in the next 10, 15 years. So as I watched kind of the, the music industry collapse in the early 2000s, I thought, you know, all this overdubs, which, hey, I'm guilty, you know, doing a million overdubs and having these albums go on for years and years and years to create and costing the artists like tens of thousands of dollars that they wouldn't ever recoup. I found that the music I enjoyed the most was when the artist sat in a circle and just rehearsed, just played. They listened to each other, no headphones, and they just played. And that's when I thought, why aren't I rolling now? Why aren't I recording this? So I met Jean-Claude um, in France at a party just completely random. He was a sound engineer. We started talking about the same kinds of things. Um, turned out his father was an audiophile speaker manufacturer, Jean-Marie Renault. You might still know about JMR speakers. Uh, Jean-Claude has taken over the company. So he's back in France doing that. And I continued the label. So as Leslie mentioned, um, we decided to come up with, at the time, what was a surround recording technique. Uh, musicians playing live. We were recording for a surround situation and listening in the room as we were recording to surround. Not really how it's done these days, but you know, I wanted to hear it. I wanted to have the sense that you could look at the musicians and imagine that they were, if you were in your home living room, you could see them right in front of you. And that was the kind of dynamic we tried to create. So we didn't really know we were starting a label at the time. And um, Gus Skinnis, who some of you might know uh, from Sony had lent us some DSD recording gear and um, the Sonoma system. Back then it was uh, 2.8 um, uh, samples per second. So it wasn't up to where we are now, which is 11.2 million. Um, but it sounded fantastic. 
So I don't know, about five years later, uh, we just decided this should be a record label. This music should be out in the world. And, and then that's what we did. And so, you know, mostly my life has been as a recording engineer. So starting a record label was not really something I knew how to do. And so the musicians I hired were just great musicians who were often session players. And I thought they could, they needed to be heard more. And they also could come in and play without having to uh, re-record a million times or do overdubs. You know, I knew that they could perform and give a passionate performance. And that's what we did. And then that led to, I don't know how many we have now, 35, 45 albums available at Blue Coast Records. So if if anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat and I and I will ask Cookie. But otherwise, I think do you want to talk a little bit about how you record things and how you make sound so wonderful and perfect? And then I think we talked about Cookie maybe giving us a little tour of her studio there. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a very small tour. Yeah. So, but just so we we can see exactly how you create the magic. Okay. Um, you know, the first week that we were recording the ESE technique or, you know, experimenting with it, I invited in, um, uh, some of the best musicians that I knew that had come through the studio and I knew they could play all day and it wouldn't be a problem. So every day we brought in a different duo or trio while we experimented with positioning the mics in a certain pattern. And we ended up with what's now called the Blue Coast Collection or the Collection One. Uh, a lot of you probably know that album better than um, any of the other ones. The first song, Looking for a Home, is probably our most listened to track. Uh, Keith Greninger, Day and Kai are just tremendous musicians. So um, I just used my ears until it sounded right. And, and essentially what makes this recording technique different than a lot of the, uh, well, what's typically taught in recording schools is that we don't use headphones. There's no headphones. The musicians position themselves to hear each other. That's first and primary. I want the musicians to hear and react to each other. Then it's my job, it's my problem to try to get the microphones around them in a way that I can get the best recording. So the music comes first, the recording comes second. So there's sacrifices, you know, I can't use the most optimum mic that I would want to use sometimes on a vocal. Sometimes I have to use a mic that's cheaper, but I can get in closer to the mouth because I need to get more vocals. Um, but essentially, what I'm trying to do is have the musicians hear each other so they can respond and react and sing in tune. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing to me how much better in tune a musician sounds when they're practicing to their guitar, the way they practice at home without headphones. We had a, we have a question from Fred Stanky. He said, I'd like to hear the history of the ADC she has used and how the quality increased as she moved through them. Well, the real history is I started on tape and I still record the tape. I have a two inch Otari MTR 90 um, that I still use. I think I bought it in 1985. Um, and up until COVID, I was still primarily, well, it's not totally right. I, I was mostly using um, still tape. But uh, do you guys all know Positive Feedback, the magazine? Yeah. So David Robinson one day said, Cookie, you really need to be recording to DSD 256. So he sent me a, a Pyramix system that we still use today. So it, in the beginning when we were using tape and um, digital, we were using uh, uh, the Sonoma system and 
I'm trying to remember the name of the, the ADC. It's, uh, it, it sounds fantastic. I still actually prefer the sound of that to what we have on the Pyramix. Um, everybody's got different tastes, but I just like that sound. And unfortunately, it doesn't allow us to record to DSD-256, which is what our customers want. So we finally gave in to using the merging technology um, uh, front end for our DSD recordings. Does that answer your question? Brad? Yes, um, I found the I found the unmute button. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> and so, and what do you use for uh, for DAC in the studio and at home? Well, the funny thing is, <clears throat> the studio is my home. Uh, it's actually three levels. I live in the, on the top floor, so I often send my mixes upstairs, and um, and I use a variety of um, speakers. Oh man, I don't even know how many speaker sets I have. Uh, I've got at least five down here in the control room, and then more upstairs, and some in another listening room. Uh, as far as the the DAX, uh, the one that I loved the most was the playback designs. I don't have one right now, um, but that was my favorite. The one we were using most of the time in the studio was the uh, MyTech Manhattan. Right now we're using a, a Brooklyn also a MyTech, um, but you know, we've got a bunch of DACs also. I've got, you know, a lot of manufacturers would send us stuff because we're pretty diligent about um, troubleshooting, beta testing, doing comparison tests. And again, a lot of it depends on the speakers you're listening through. So any one of these DACs could sound better on a different system. It all depends on your speakers and your you know entire chain, cable, amp, everything. But we're beta testing um, a pro gear right now for a company called Millennia. And this is something else I learned. You know, I came from the pro audio world. I knew, and I still have a lot of friends who are manufacturing for professional audio. Those DACs, sadly, in my opinion, don't sound as good as what the consumer uh, gets to listen to. And I think that this is a real shame. So uh, mostly what we use in the studio are consumer DACs. We are beta testing some uh, gear for professional audio and we hope that one day <laughs> they get to experience what we experience in the consumer world. Hmm. Rohit right. had a question. All right, Rohit had a question. Can you share your thoughts on tape versus digital DSD recording? Which do you prefer sonically true to event? Well, man, I love tape. I love tape. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, yeah, tape colors the sound. Because truthfully, if I A, B, and I listen to DSD-256 compared to what's coming in from the microphone, okay, that's the sound that's coming in through the microphone. But if I listen to real life and I listen through the, you know, good tape, freshly recorded, there's nothing like it. I mean, it's just um, kind of an emotional experience. And, and I believe it's something that happens in the mid-range. Uh, I had long conversations with Andreas Koch. You guys all know Andreas? He um, actually used to work at Sony, was one of the early developers of DSD, and he uh, is the manufacturer of playback design devices. So uh, when I first got the Playback Designs DAC, I said, how did you get such a great mid-range? And he, I still don't really know, but I mean, that was the reason why I liked it so much was it did have more of a, a, a quality about the mid-range that I almost can't describe. But I can say that even listening on MP3 to a good recording from the late 80s or early 90s, <laughs> You can hear the difference. You can hear a recording on tape that was done on tape, even on an MP3. 
And it's when it's you say tape, do you mean analog tape? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry to Yeah. Analog tape, uh, two inch. <laughs> One of the reasons I don't record on it so much anymore is because they're not making tape like they used to. It's just hard to find good quality tape. So aside from the fact that a 15 to 30 minute reel costs $400, $500 for that 15 minutes of recording. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the tape, it's pretty iffy if it's going to play back. So now, um, you know, we have a couple of artists that want to record on tape. So what we do is we say, look, we're going to bake the tape first. I've got to protect my machine. So we bake the tape. It's a whole process that is also used in archiving, which we do. So we archive tape to um, digital audio. And, um, and then I run a test tone through the entire reel and I listen back to it. And then I have to go back and erase it a couple of times so that there's no artifacts. But uh, yeah, so it's not like the days when you could just buy an Ampex or Quantigy reel. Um, so it's really hard, but I, I gotta say that now you know, I do so much recording in DSD that uh, I don't want to say I'm used to the sound. I like it enough that, and it's so much less problems that it, it you know, it's not going to change over time. It's not going to degrade. I mean, <laughs> believe me, digital has its problems, especially in storage. You just never quite know what's going to come back. Software changes, different upgrades to the computer. There's so many sticky points. Uh, in fact, I should mention that that same system that David Robinson um, sent to us. We haven't upgraded because we tried and it wouldn't accept like the hundreds, thousands of hours we had previously recorded in the upgrade. So the, the one of the sad parts, and this is true of just about every digital audio workstation. We also have a Pro Tools system here and I was involved in the early development of Pro Tools and digital audio recording in the, um, mid early eighties. Um, when the software changes, you get a new program uh, put in, you know, the, the computer has some kind of upgrade. You've got to take it off the internet. You can't let it touch it. And so if we want to expand our DSD 256 DOS uh, digital audio workstation, my plan is just to buy a whole new system and then lock it in, make it work, and never let it go to the internet. Okay, we have a couple more questions for you. Uh, do you record multi-track DSD? If so, do you mix down through your analog mixing console to stereo? If you're recording with no headphones, do you record live only, no overdubs? A multi-point question there. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I still get a lot of gigs as an audio engineer. So as an audio engineer, we had to do a couple of things. One was I, I had to get a Pro Tools system because there's too many musicians working at home and I needed to have Pro Tools. So that's my paid gig. I get paid to do that. I will work on Pro Tools. I have engineers that specialize in Pro Tools and I just tell them what to do. And then we mix through the recording console, which I'll give you a quick shot. There you go. So the... Um, I'll just put it over there so you can see it for a minute. So it's a 48 input channel. I've got all my analog reverbs that I've been using for a lot of years. And there's just no plugins that really match the quality that I can get out of this analog board. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's a lot of issues in dealing with digital audio that I just prefer not to uh, challenge myself with. And part of it is just the CPU power that gets used up. So if you, if you try to do something that would be easy in analog, sometimes it's just not that easy in digital. So I just prefer to bring up, well, in fact, I should say like the first half of the console is for Pro Tools. The second half is for um, my Paramix system. They both go through the systems and I monitor I listen through the board when I'm recording anything. And so it's called post. I listen post audio. That way I can, you know, experiment with EQ changes if I need, adding reverb, and nothing is committed to the final product until I mix it. 
And then yes, I mix through the console. And typically I always mix to DSD 256. So if a session starts on Pro Tools, I'll mix it out to DSD 256. Now, not to confuse you, that is my life as an audio engineer. When it comes to Blue Coast Records, I don't want anything touching Pro Tools. I do not like the sound. I'm not an, an, uh, an advocate of PCM recording. That's just me. I know a lot of people feel differently. Okay, you cover. We have a bunch of questions. We have a bunch of questions. I'm trying to keep this straight here because you've covered some of these things. Um, uh, Oliver, it's my understanding many well-known recording engineers apply tweaks to the raw recording, which you just mentioned, such as some EQ to achieve the sound they like. What is your philosophy regarding sonic adjustments after the recording is made? You do. Do you? How much of it would you yeah. like to do? Well, I try not to do any, but there's just times that I I have to because like I mentioned, when I'm recording uh, for a Blue Coast Records project and there's no headphones, I sometimes have to do things um, in my mic placement that's not the optimum sound. For instance, when you put a microphone in closer to the vocal, so you get a more isolated vocal, it's um, especially useful if you have a, a vocalist that's playing the guitar at the same time. You might get too much guitar in that vocal microphone if you don't get it close enough. And even then, you won't have the ability to completely punch in, punch out, fix stuff, the kind of things that you would do if the vocal was isolated and recorded separately. So, excuse me. <clears throat> so what I would do is get in close, sometimes use a, a cheaper microphone than I'd like to, and I know it's going to require removing some of the bottom end because as you get closer to the sound, you're going to get more bottom end. Ideally, I can mic a little farther back. I'll listen to the sound in the room to optimize where I would like to have it. That's where I start. And then it's just a matter of can I really get the optimum sound? Now, in some cases, I've been really lucky. I just did a recording with um, Fiona Joy Hawkins and Rebecca Daniel, uh, piano, violin, which it's like, well, uh, Rebecca's playing a 200-year-old a, a violin. The sound is unbelievable. And the two of them together, I didn't have to use any EQ at all. I got really, I got kind of lucky on that. So, I mean, optimally, I would rather not use EQ. I would rather position the microphone in a way that I don't have to. Great, thank okay. you very much. Okay, I think I think we wanna switch over. Jim is all over me to get to the six degrees of, of degradation talk. So I wanna make sure everybody's questions about mixing is answered. Um, we had, uh, Fred, how many tracks in the task cam? Did you answer that one? You... In the task cam? I don't have a task cam. Oh, okay. Oh, what? I, okay. I, that was Fred's question. I'm sorry. So your tape recorder, how many, uh, when you record the tape, how many tracks? 24. Thank you. Oh. No, yeah, it's an, sorry, it's an that. Atari. That's okay. <laughs> Otari. Otari. Uh, yeah, it's an sorry. Otari. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And I think the DSD to DSD 256 question was answered. What's the console? That was Sam's question. The console is a um, sound workshop. Uh, forgot the model number, but I bought it from Patrick Gleason, who uh, was the founder of Different Fur and a well-known sound designer, um, soundtrack fella in San Francisco who moved to Los Angeles. And um, yeah, I remember the day I went in to look at it and my studio manager said, you're going to buy that, aren't you? And I said, no, I'm just going to look. Well, he lived um, uh, on the hills of San Francisco. And in order to get it out of his room, we had to hire a crane to lift it up about 40 feet. And it was... <laughs> And the crane had a flat tire. And this console, which I got to show it to you, a lot of people couldn't 
couldn't buy it because it was just too big. Huge. <laughs> we could barely get it in, in our room. So, you know, watching this massive board where the legs could not be removed, everything had to move intact, swinging in the air, almost <laughs> knocking out windows at apartments in San Francisco. <laughs> It's a terrifying thought that still haunts me to this day. Is that like 10 feet long? <laughs> oh, God. At least. At least. <laughs> what does it weigh? I don't even know. You know, I brought it down here once. I'm thinking I've had it now for about 25 years and I've got to change the carpet. I, I don't know how I'm going to do this because we're going to have to move the console. You've I had to remove the door to the ceiling. Yeah, I'll bring in a crane. <laughs> Twist it up. <laughs> yeah okay okay anybody else any other questions and then we're going to switch over oh okay uh we have a question i see that pcm versions of the music are in 2496 or 24192 if the master is in dsd those sampling frequencies a multiple of 88.2 wouldn't pcm at 2482 or 2476.4 be more natural yes it would <laughs> it's a bad when, question it's a it's a <laughs> Excellent question. And yeah. on our yeah. older sites, we used to uh, convert to all the formats. But I got to tell you, very few people would actually buy those formats. And the cost of keeping them up at Amazon was outrageous. I mean, even now, um, our biggest selling formats is DSD 256 and the DSD formats. I would say 70% of our sales are DSD. So for us to you know, if somebody really wants something in, in 88.2 or whatever, I'll do it for them, but I'm not going to store it up there and make it for sale all the time. It's, it's, it just became too much of a headache and I had to draw the line. Owning a record store and a record label, I thought owning a studio was bad, but a label and a store, just put the gun, boom. It's crazy. <laughs> Don't do it. Okay. So let's, let's switch over to, uh, the the mix, the master, six degrees of degradation. <laughs> so you might be wondering what those six degrees are. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it you know it's a little something I came up with. Uh, boy, maybe twelve years ago, and I started doing a presentation at the audiophile conventions because I realized there was a lot of confusion about how a recording is made. And then it arrives to the consumer. And there are stages in between that um, somebody has the opportunity to color and destroy the sound. In fact, anytime you do anything, even putting up the microphones, you're making decisions and choices about the sound. So that's the first stage is recording. Then you've got, in my case, multi-tracks. It doesn't just come out stereo. That's not the way I want to work. It comes out in multi-tracks. So, um, you know, whether it's 24 tracks on tape or unlimited tracks on digital or however we record it, you make fine adjustments to the sound. Maybe you want a little more vocal because the, the artist looked away from the microphone for a second and you lost a few words. Maybe they got a little too loud and headed for the microphone. So there's little things you want to do just to make a better experience. That also has to do with panning and imaging, which um, I'm going to explain for a second because I had an, a musician come in who wanted to be an audio engineer and didn't know what panning was. So panning is when you make a decision, are you going to hear this sound on the left or on the right? That's for a stereo system. So I most of my recordings I mix in stereo. And there are unlimited choices in between, between that hard left and hard right panning. You could put it in the center, you could put a little over to the left, a little over to the right. Add to that if you have two microphones on an instrument. Add to that if you throw one out of phase. There are so many variations of what you can do to make left and right and panning. So those are kind of key issues, the level and the panning. And also, do you want to add a little uh, more reverb? Do you want to make it sound like, um, you know, you're in the Grand Canyon or you're in a church or whatever? Like I typically create what's called an environment for my smaller recordings. 
where I might use a couple of delays, two or three different reverbs, long, short, medium that reflect at different um, frequencies. All those are decisions that are made in the mix. And that's um, a mix engineer's job. So that's stage two. Stage three is mastering. Mastering is um, used to be when you take all your mixes and the mastering engineer would adjust the level so you have a nice experience for listening to your vinyl or your, to your CD. Uh, nowadays, it's hard to say what people are doing because they're sending in one songs. Machines have calculated you know, how much they should smash things, uh, oops, I mean, make them louder. Apple has a, a, you know, criteria they've set that I tend to ignore. Um, but anyway, mastering is where you, you, you even out, you try to even out the levels between all the songs. So you have a nice experience. You adjust the uh, space between the songs edit the top and the tails to make also, you know, get rid of some of the clicks and bumps that might happen there. Um, but you also prepare that master for additional manufacturing. So vinyl mastering is a very different thing than CD mastering or mastering for DSD for upload or even for streaming. So there's different masters that get sent out for different purposes. Uh, now, typically something I realized, and the reason why I started this, this series called Six Degrees was uh, when I worked for the record label and when I work as an audio engineer, I realized the producer really only has the privilege of the first three stages, recording, mixing, mastering. After that, we don't know what happens to it. And there's other things that happen that we have less control over. So a production master is made that we rarely get to hear. You never know what the streaming services are gonna do to the sound. The, the distributor, I mean, I discovered this, I ran a bunch of tests because what I was sending directly to CoBuzz and what my distributor was sending directly co to CoBuzz should have been the same master. But I had a way of testing it and it wasn't, it didn't sound the same. So you never know what's gonna happen. and. You guys may have experienced if you're listening to downloads or streams that even in the last year, sound quality has changed within a DSP, a digital service provider, a streaming service. They're always upgrading. They're making decisions on how loud something's going to come out. They're going to norm what's called normalize, which is also a way of throwing a, a limiter compressor in the mix so you get so you get the ultimate experience at home. But it may not be the sound that you like. And part of the reason I found this out was when um, iTunes first was available. You know, I as a producer, I never listened to what was coming out on, on the DSPs back 15, 20 years ago. I, I turned in my master. I made it sound as good as I could, mainly for the vinyl and the CD. And then I heard iTunes and what they did to one of my albums, and it was unrecognizable. So that's when I started getting more involved in the whole process. So you've got process, uh, the fourth degree is, is the production master. The fifth is what the, um, the streaming services are doing to it. And the sixth is how is the consumer hearing it? Literally, I work with people who come in and say, Cookie, listen to this. This is what I did. And they're playing it to me on their iPhone. You know, now I'm not going to do a separate mix for the iPhone and one for the laptop and one for my, my, my Sony speaker system or any of my systems here. That's, but it's pretty crazy what people are listening to it. And all you can do as a, an engineer is try to listen on all the systems and come up with the best compromise you can. And <clears throat> those are the six degrees. So Cookie, what is remastering? Is it just a scam to get us to buy our music again or sell us in a different mix? Uh, no, there's a, you know, from a marketing perspective. Um, I mean, it, it implies they didn't get it right the first time. Well, here's one thing to consider. 
Now, I don't know if you all remember what your system sounded like back in the 80s, but if you listen to a lot of the recordings back in the 80s, they didn't have a lot of bass. That was because the speaker systems being sold had a lot more bass. So there was a whole period and generation of people listening with less bass. And if you listen to some of those recordings today, they sound like what happened to the bottom end. And I think people's taste and their ears, what they're listening on changes. So the remastering process, you know, in theory is supposed to bring it up to date. Um, I don't know exactly when it happened, when people started making the CDs louder and louder and louder. But if you put on, if you own an original Nirvana album, when it first came out in the early 90s. And you put on a remastered version or probably even bought a newer version, it's gonna be a lot louder. Because truthfully, we weren't concerned with volume at that time. We weren't trying to make the loudest record. We were just trying to make a good sound. So volume wasn't Part of our vocabulary and then somebody got Does that mean that they're limited more at the at the high end yeah yeah so what typically happens is um a remaster you know is a mastering engineer's idea of what this should sound like and how to optimize it for today's listening systems or or dsp services so, you know, in their way, they're doing what they think is best. They are noticeably louder. Yeah. And and maybe it's psychological, but louder inevitably sounds better. Um, well, that was the theory <laughs> in why they kept making CDs louder and louder and louder. Until it got to the point of kind of ridiculous where... Um, the CDs were so loud, like you could listen to some heavy metal band and which has got this powerful sound. But when you put it on the speakers, it sounded really small because what compression tends to do is cut off the high end, cut off the low end. So you had no power. You couldn't really get any bass. Bass going through a compressor or a limiter just gets squished and you lose detail. But it's a choice that a lot of the artists make. You know, they just want to be louder and want to be more competitive. And the sonics come second. Oh, Larry had a question. I think this is Larry. Is it really louder or is it more compressed so that the sound level is nearly the same and not dynamic? You know, again, it depends on the mastering engineer. But if you're hearing it louder than the original, I'm going to guess, um, you know, I'd have to hear and compare, but uh, more than likely there's a limiter thrown on the top of it. Maybe some EQ is done to compensate for the limiter and sometimes some compression. I know we do it in our role as mastering studio and as my role working with artists who are paying me to deliver what they want, not what I want. I typically send them three versions. I send them the one that I like, one that's 5 dB louder, and one that's 5 dB louder than that. And I let them choose. What they do, and the reason why I do this, is they listen, comparing it to other things they're hearing on Spotify. And they want it to sound like what everybody else is doing. So sadly, it's not always about sound quality. It's about how loud. Mm -hmm. Dan, Dan Rubin had an interesting question. <laughs> kind of funny. Most of us are probably listening to streaming services offering CD quality or better. Often there's a choice. 1644, 2496, 24192. How legit are these different offerings? Are we being scammed? <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll tell you who's being scammed. I don't want to mention names, but I, I have seen the contracts and larger files, a 9624 file, a 192 file are much bigger than a 44116 bit. And what will happen is in our contracts, our relationships as a label, 
they pay us less money for you to stream the high resolution. It's because the storage and the cost of streaming is that much more. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. It's a sad, <laughs> sad day. So while they get the benefits of the high resolution, and I understand because we have a service also, and I know what it costs just to store this, the, the music. The bigger the file, the more it costs to store, the more it costs to stream. So the people that are getting hurt are the artists and the labels. They take that money out of our pocket, not yours. They, in fact, typically charge you more money for the high resolution mm -hmm. while we get paid less. Yeah. No, no wonder Spotify Hi-Fi didn't see the light of day after they paid Billie Eilish to announce it. <laughs> well, you know what they did this year? Now... Uh, this is as of January 1st, 2024, you have to have a minimum of 1,000 streams per track per year before they even pay out. Now, oh. yeah, so the thing about Spotify that I've had to uh, talk to my artists about is it, it's really become more like broadcast radio where the labels didn't get paid, the artists didn't get paid in broadcast radio either. The only people that got paid in broadcast radio was the publisher and the composer. So I know this is a very, this is one of the most confusing businesses there are, but the artist who is singing the song does not get paid on broadcast radio. Internet radio is different. Internet radio, there's a, a, a system called sound exchange that allows both the artist, the performer, and the label to get paid. So we have to sign up for it, but at least there's some way over there. But okay. it's a it's a crazy business. So what Spotify did, um, knowing that they've been one of the few services to enhance the back end of their um, system for artists. So there's a lot of information. So if they're trying to do a tour, Typically, the venue will look at the Spotify followers, how many people are following this person, and that will give them a determination whether or not they're going to hire them to do a concert. So that's become the value of Spotify is really as a tool to get concerts. Well, so John Hughes had an interesting question. Which streaming service treats you as a label the best? Um... Well, I would say number one is CoBuzz. And it's partly because um, I work directly with them. I'm, I'm David Solomon, Dan Mahdi are great people. <clears throat> I've known David Solomon, you guys probably all know David too, from various companies before he arrived at CoBuzz. He gave us a lot of early opportunities and that direct relationship to the back end of CoBuzz is invaluable. I mean, we can send something back there and we can ask them to change it. And, it, it, you know, it's direct. We don't have to go through a distributor and cross our fingers whether or not they're going to put up the right files. But, um, oh, gosh, we've got a whole bunch here. Okay. <laughs> Trying to keep these straight. Uh, great discussion, Cookie. This, uh, what do you think about multi-channel sound and now Dolby Atmos? That was actually a good question. If you're recording in the room, are there compromises when you have to put the musicians in a stereo field? Um, no, you know what? Uh, I'll, first I'll talk about the, the, what they call immersive sound. It's kind of a, a general term that the recording academy Academy, formerly, you know, the Grammys, um, uh, call it. So it used to be surround sound, the 5.1. And that's why we started Blue Coast Records. We wanted to create surround sound recorded specifically for surround. So that was our, <laughs> that was our dream. What we discovered was very few people are going to have the same setup, even recording engineers. There was no, um, there was no real setup. There were different kinds of surround, for instance, where you place the speakers 
Um, there was Sony's method. There were other people's method. And if you put those speakers in different places, you're going to get a different sound. Now, the other problem with surround was the cost. I mean, you've got the you know, the five speakers and you've got the, the bass. And then in Atmos, you have even more. And some systems, you got 11 and 13, and all kinds of speakers everywhere. But what we discovered were people at home had, oh, there's a bookshelf speaker over there and there's another one over there. And there was no real continuity in how people were listening to surround. I was fortunate enough to be on the first um, uh, panel to select uh, the winner of the, the surround sound Grammy award. And I remember that first day, it was 30 of the top engineers and uh, I was the only woman and that was kind of fun. I had a little cheering group of people, other women who were back there going, yeah, go cookie. Yeah, so I, it was, it, but being in a room with people who from classical to pop to you name it, every album, your favorite albums were there. And we couldn't decide on what to listen to and how to listen. So they kicked us all out and they let Al Schmidt set it up. Al Schmidt, if you guys know, is was just a legendary uh, recording engineer who worked at Capitol. So it took a, it took like a day and we had to start the whole thing over the next day because we had to first vote that we gave it to Al to set up. And then from then on, you're just thinking, how are people going to do this at home? It's going to be impossible. Well, that brings us to today with Atmos. Um, I've been on those same panels. I've, you know, had the uh, the luxury of having somebody else set up these perfect listening environments. But the reality is, is you don't know what a, an album's going to sound like on one set of speakers and then another. In fact, the last time I did an immersive panel, um, we were listening to an Atmos recording and it sounded unbelievable. I'm not going to mention any names. But then we were invited to go to Sony down here in Foster City and listen. It didn't sound anything like what I heard before. I'm not sure I would have voted for that album had I heard it first at the Sony system. Not to say Sony was right. Just saying it's just different. So what I don't know how people are really going to listen at home which brings us to Apple, who created this whole spatial environment and are pushing spatial probably to sell headphones. Um, I'm not opposed to it. And I think actually the headphone listening experience maybe will be a, a, a more even in the long run way to listen because it's just, you can actually have your ears tuned to how you're supposed to hear it. And then you adjust, uh, you know, there's these, these software programs that a lot of people are using. So you can get that experience in the headphone. But you know what? I don't like to listen in headphones. So right now, my Atmos system is packed away. And I'm just staying with stereo for a while. So on that, on that thought, I don't like headphones either personally, but Grant had a question. Are you able to listen to music and truly enjoy it? Are you constantly analyzing the recordings and the performance? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. You know, it was funny because earlier Leslie was asking, um, she said, it might come up that, you know, what are you listening to? And I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, once I'm out of the studio, I am not listening. Um, I kind of want to get away from it. I want to go outside. I want to listen to the ocean. I want to listen to the wind. I want to listen to the birds because I'm listening all day and it really is hard. I mean, typically, you know, my crew sees me, I come in and they're playing something. I go, what is that? How did they get that bad a sound? I mean, uh, it, it, it's amazing. I mean, you guys probably, you know who Taylor Swift is. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to hear what all the, buzz was about with the the latest uh release which is called Fortnite. because i listen on my laptop guilty i'm guilty i'll listen on and i thought the <clears throat> excuse me the production not necessarily her vocal but the production was pretty amazing it was something i would have done 
And I thought, you know what? Just because I'm not a Taylor Swift fan, I don't want to hold it against her. If something's good, it's good. So I brought it down to my crew and I and I forced them to listen to it. And I have one girl, not a Taylor Swift fan, who's like 22 and another woman who's um, 39. And, you know, we all have our own feelings about pop music. I said, well, let's compare Beyonce's run around country boy hit to Taylor Swift's new hit and see what is going on in pop music. Well, okay, we were listening to MP3s off YouTube because that's all we had. But I got to say, they weren't bad. And I I hate to say this, but the Taylor Swift production kind of was better than the, for me, my taste, better than what the Beyonce production was. What I heard in the Beyonce production was cutting off a lot of words. It's called the noise gate. You know, they want to take out the breaths, so they chop stuff off, but that's the stuff that bugs me. So yeah, to answer your question, I'm always listening to the production. If I can't get past the production, uh, mm -hmm. I can't hear anything. It just drives me nuts. What do you think about MQA? I don't even know if it still exists anymore. <laughs> I like those people. I like them a lot. <laughs> you, um, <laughs> you know it was a better option than than a lot of the the lower wave formats but for me nothing beats dsd so you know that's just my opinion well it's not, it seems like dsd is one out <laughs> oh I'm not seeing that much I, MQA anymore. So. No, uh, yeah. In fact, I think they closed it down. I don't know if any uh, buddy bought the company yet, but yeah, I thought it was bankrupt and somebody was gonna buy it, but I, I hadn't heard. I don't know if anybody's heard. Um, let me see. I think we have more that I might have skipped. What are your microphone preferences and why? Hmm. <laughs> oh, well, if you could only see what I'm using on my vocal right now. Uh, well, I have, you know, I have some favorites, but they all function a little bit differently. So, um, like what I use on the piano are these, uh, B and K 4012s. It's a powered set of microphones that really is the only microphone that can handle, um, the full dynamic of a piano without distorting. And B&K uh, got bought out. I can't remember the name of the company that bought them out, but you know they still make a similar kind of microphone. Um, the 4011s, which are, are plus 48, are supposed to be the same mic, <clears throat> couldn't really handle the piano in the same way. So I've owned these mics for, well, my 35 years maybe. Um, and same with, I have some AKG 414s that I bought. I didn't know what I was doing. I walked in with a bunch of money and they sold me these two expensive microphones. For 10 years, I didn't like them. They were on my bad list. So I just put them to the side. But what I discovered was they actually sound really good in certain function functioning areas. Like I do this thing um, when I'm recording a vocal, I call it the backup plan. And the 414s, uh, you know, I'll put one here and then I'll put the backup plan out here. So if a vocalist gets too loud, I can switch over to the other one. So I don't do a stereo miking on the vocal, but these 414s work really well for that. I've got KM184s I love on the bass and on the, uh, on guitars. But again, it depends if I'm doing a solo guitar, man, one, Neumann U67 can sound fantastic. And I love the Neumann, uh, the whole line, the U67s, the 87s, all those microphones are incredible. But a lot of times I can't use them, um, you know, because they pick up so well all the instruments if I'm, if I'm not just recording one person in a room. I'll use an SM7 for a vocal. Or for a guitar, if I need to get close and get more sound. So I, uh, those are just some of the mics I use. And... Okay. We have another listening question. Uh, why have more than one pair of near field monitors on the console? 
Also, when listening for pleasure, do you listen at similar close distance on similar speakers? Most audiophiles seem to listen 10 plus feet away and many on much bigger speakers. Do you have an opinion on what's closest to the original sound? Uh, no, you know, I can't go by original sound as much as what the majority of the people are going to hear at their homes. Um, I don't know if any of you came to the recording we did with Jenna Mamina and Matt Rawlings probably 12 years ago, but they were up in my piano room and there was no headphones. There was no amplification on Jenna's voice. There were 25 audio files sitting in that room. Her voice can be easily, uh, is kind of, well, the piano can just take over because she's got a very soft, delicate voice. When they would come down in the room to hear the playback, they'd say, that doesn't sound anything like what it sounded up in the room. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know. That's the way I want it to sound good at home when you're listening. So the natural sound that's in the room may not be what I really want to send out and make available for sale. And as far as having um, a lot of different speakers, uh, I do that also because I made that mistake early in my career, trusting one set of speakers and you make it sound fantastic on that one set of speakers and it won't sound right anywhere else. So, um, and I also like to tell my artists that the worst place to sit really is in front of the, the console. I don't know if you guys can see this, but I have a little pair of, little tiny pair of speakers in there called Oratones. Mm -hmm. uh, they were like 60 bucks 40 years ago, but they're there for a reason. They're there so I can listen to what people might be listening to in their cars. And then all these speakers have a different sound quality. Let me just turn it on this. And I use them for different things. Like for instance, those tannoys in the back, I cannot mix on those, but they sound fantastic. So I like to listen on those. If I wanna get a even mix, um, I'll tend to work with these. Those are NH, the NHTs for the longest period of time. And the real trick is trying to listen soft enough so that you don't get tired and you're not hearing the reflections in the room. And then um, I have another room I'll go to where I often keep the artist hidden away with uh, a, a Sony pair, uh, the AR1s, if you're familiar with those, and a Nelson Pass amp. And those sound great. And there's a couch in there, and it's much more like an audiophile listening environment. But I'll show you over here. Oops, those are my little chimes. So back here, you can see a couple of chairs. Um, that chair in the middle is probably the best place to listen. And I give that up to the artist so they can listen. And then I've learned to adjust. I know when I have to go listen in a certain spot. At the end of the day, they don't know my room the way I know my room. They're going to have to judge this at home. So I try to make something that they're going to like in their home. Okay. Uh, Larry had a comment. Your vinyl Fiona Joy Hawkins 600 Years in a Moment is an awesome sounding album. Do you plan on doing more vinyl releases? Well, you know, we didn't do that. Uh, that wasn't our vinyl. That was Fiona's. All of our artists have their own label. That's Fiona's label. We help her sell it. You know, we're we're here to help the artist do their thing. And, and it was a great album. I don't think Fiona will do another vinyl because uh, it's very expensive. It's tough to ship. And... Unless you're a pop star, vinyl doesn't really sell in the way, you know, we need it to recoup the cost. So, um, I mean, Blue Coast Records has never made a vinyl yet. We've come close. Uh, and we might still, I, I'm not opposed to vinyl. I love vinyl, but it's just very uh, expensive. It takes a lot of room for storage. There's a lot of things to consider. 
we had another vinyl question. <laughs> Obviously, we have a lot of vinyl enthusiasts. Uh, Sam's question. It seems, seems like there are also valid remasters using original masters versus production masters. Yes. And what's your take on remastered for vinyl? Well, I I used to master. When I worked for Wyndham Hill, one of my jobs was to go to the mastering sessions with Bernie Grunman. And when I first was going to those man mastering sessions, all we sold were vinyl. And you might remember cassettes. And then somewhere towards the end of my um, my period at Wyndham Hill, we started releasing CDs. You you can't do the same kind of mastering for vinyl that you can for CDs. It's it is two different worlds. Now, really, the sad part about this is a lot of record labels aren't familiar with this. I did a DSD recording. Um, a for an artist, and I won't mention his name, he's on a, another label and he's really well known in jazz circles. We did this beautiful solo piano recording and the label made vinyl from the 44116 bit PCM. And I gotta say, I was a little bit miffed at why they made that choice, but for them, they didn't care. They weren't an audiophile label. It was just, a, it was a jazz label. They Sad to say, most people at record labels don't know the intricacies of mastering and the audiophile world and what what we're looking for sonically. Uh, we had another question. Uh, how do you feel about recording with just one stereo pair of microphones? I forgot what the industry term is for that, especially when music does not have vocals. Uh... You know, it's a certain sound. It's not something I do. I, I mean, I've done it. It's pretty easy for me to put up two sets of microphones and record to, you mm -hmm. know, some kind of recording system. Um, when you record that way, you have to be a little farther back from the instruments. And uh, I can definitely, you know, I can see some of the advantages. It's It's a lot less complicated. If you're, especially if you're recording a symphony and, you know, you don't have to run like 20 mics over the dis different um, instruments. So it's easier. I don't know that I'm, I, it's not something I aspire to do, but I know a lot of people do that, you know, two mic setup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ian had a question. You're feeling with regards to Octave Studio, which is PS Audio in Boulder. Well, you know, Paul McGowan was one of our first um, supporters and fans, and he did a lot of for us at Blue Coast Records. He was an advocate for DSD. Uh, I, ha I have to say I haven't really listened to a lot of the recordings they've done. Uh, I think I just get caught up in my own world and dealing with my, you know, my clients that come in who are artists and pay me to do their their music. So I'm really not so familiar with some of the other audiophile uh, labels, especially, I don't know, COVID just kind of shut us down and uh, it was a rough time. Um, but what do you guys think about Octave? He seems to be playing to a different audience than uh, you're playing to, in my opinion. Mm. He brings in people. He's got some expensive microphones and he's got some expensive equipment there and he's got some money to burn. And uh, he's building a library of uh, discs. Uh, you've been doing it for a lot longer than he has, but he's uh, pumping them out. Uh, but he's only getting the people that are local, more or less. Uh, they come in and do a, you know, whatever. And, uh, but he is producing the uh, vinyl on 45 and 33, as well as all the other CDs and, and, and uh, downloads and that. So you can buy a, a variety of what you want. Um, I'm just curious how you fit in compared to how he fits in. You seem to be doing somewhat the same. Yeah, I think the the <laughs> the words money to burn come to mind. Um, <laughs> uh, I would make vinyl too if I had the money, but realistically, um, you know, he's got a he's got a much bigger 
uh, system behind him. Well, he that's sells true. power amps. He makes his money in a different way. You know, I, I, I'm just kind of amazed that after COVID, we've been booked solid in the recording studio. And I think it's because people really miss the community. It's almost like, you know, you're familiar with working with engineers and producers who know your sound and they come to you. Um, and it's fun for us too. So, you know, we work with people over their whole career, seven, eight albums. And a lot of them aren't on Blue Coast. And like I mentioned earlier, some of them still want to record to tape. Some of them are making vinyl. It's not Blue Coast Records because Blue Coast Records, I get the last say, and that's not what most artists want. You know, most artists want to have say in their music. Sure. I let them, yeah, you know, I let them come in and record and then bye-bye, I make the decisions. And I mean, they get to listen to it. If they want to change a couple of things and I agree, it's, it's not a big deal. But, um, you know, Paul's just got a, you know, he's got a different uh, way of looking at it and different, you know, he's uh, been doing it for 50 years. Selling year amps. Has, has been when he started in, in 74. And yeah. the guy that just retired at 80, I knew him when he had first started. I've been with, with PS since uh, 76 when they hired uh, Bill Apple now. Mm. So uh, I was just curious. That's all. I won't say anymore, but thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you, Cookie. Well, so, you know what? I, I really like Paul and I read his. Well, I, do, I do too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I was going to say uh, the other day, I haven't really written in last year because I've been dealing with a bunch of stuff I have to take care of. And um, there was a, a subject that came up that was interesting. And he had gone into the control room uh, at another studio and this engineer played him back a mix. And the engine, did you remember this? No, I don't. Post I, that came out. Bring it up. And, um, <clears throat> and it was horrible. And it was horrible. <laughs> And Paul didn't know what to oh, say. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I remember him saying that. Yeah, he and Terry were there. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, that, I, I mean, I was feeling for him and I wanted to write in and just say, how many times have I heard that? Because really, you know, and I, I read some of the discussions about the whys and wherefores and all this stuff. I got to tell you, the audiophile community is a very special, unique community that can even talk in the kind of terms we're talking about. Yeah. But when I get students in from local audio schools all over, they send them to me, we have to start over. They don't teach them how to record real instruments. They don't teach them about noise floor. They teach, they basically show them a bunch of these plugins and I, uh, it's, these, the gain stages are all wrong. The, the amount of, I mean, I can barely handle it. We have to start over. I don't care what kind of Pro Tools certification they got. <laughs> you know, that's over. And so I was going to write in and, and, and kind of mention that the, the problem starts at the schools and how they're teaching. They're not teaching kids how to record real instruments. And maybe that's our fault for being older and that we still remember real musicianship. Yeah, thank you, Cookie. Thank you. So, Cookie, we've got we have about eight minutes. I'm just curious to hear how you feel about the state of the music industry today, and <laughs> where we're going in the future. And is AI going to kill musicianship? <laughs> I uh, I was just having this discussion the other day. Um, you know, I, we were we were comparing remixes and remasters of this Taylor Swift song that came out. And I was talking to my um, engineer, my 22 year old Pro Tools engineer. And I said, you know, I had been hired by a couple of AI companies who said that they could remove certain parts and do this and that. And they said they wanted some music from me. So I said, okay. I sent them down with some of my Blue Coast recordings. Well, they couldn't use them because it was recorded all at the same time. So AI was impossible. Like, in other words, removing the bass part, changing the bass part was impossible for them. But these systems, when you're doing overdubs, can kind of figure out how to remove vocals uh, in a much better method than what we used to do in the past. And also in this case, 
this one remix um, was able to remove all the instruments except the vocals and then reprocess. But when I listened to the sound, the sound just didn't make me want to listen again. I mean, it sounded fine on a laptop, it sounded fine on a phone, but it sounded horrible coming through my speakers. So I, you know, I'm hoping that there's going to be a renaissance of people really learning their instruments, people wanting to be in a community of musicians. I got to tell you about this session coming up. So Derek Jones, who's a, one of our Blue Coast artists, he's, he's a bass player. He plays in Cirque du Soleil and at the Cause show. He's done it for 15, 20 years. Derek's coming into the area. And I said, hey, Derek, let's just do a session and have fun. And he said, yeah, let's just have fun. So we called up a bunch of other Blue Coast artists just to have fun. I mean, I don't think I've ever done this in my career as an audio engineer. Just said, let's just have fun. These are people I've made friends with. Jenna's going to be here. Jenna Mamina, John R. Burr, Liberty Elman, who's a guitar player I used to work with in the 90s, who was working for Blue Note for a while. We're just going to have fun. I mean, what kind of concept is that? And I'm going to record it. That, you know, AI can't replace that. AI can't replace the community and the sense of fun that we're going to have. I hope not. <laughs> yeah. It certainly, certainly seems to be changing everything. So um, any final questions? This has been really, really wonderful. And I think if anybody, everybody can make it on the September 28th, we get another taste of cookie. <laughs> oh, and I don't want to forget, but we're going to give you guys a special, oh, yeah. a special something. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to share some unreleased music with you. So if you write to me, uh, write to support at bluecoastmusic.com, support at bluecoastmusic.com. In the heading, just write um, Audio File Foundation and write whatever you want. If you want to ask me a question, I'll, I'll be happy to answer. But um, we'll send you a link over the weekend to some... Uh, they're going to be WAV files. They're going to be WAV files right now. Eventually, they'll be a DSD. But you're going to get a sneak peek into some of the uh, music we're working on that's coming up. Now we okay. know who support is. The buck stops here. <laughs> and we'll try to we'll try to email that out to everyone too. So, okay. um, really, really appreciate your insights, Cookie. This has been fantastic and. You've been a contributor to our group for many, many years. I think the last time we had, we were trying to figure out when we had done something together, maybe over 10 years ago. So we're glad to have you back and I'd love to see you in person as well as the rest of the group. And we will uh, get this posted, but uh, thank you all for coming. And thank you again, Cookie. You're wonderful. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thanks.